Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy almost New Year. This is the last Sabbath for this year, 2014. And we move on to 2015 with renewed hope that we continue to be not only one day closer, but one year closer to the great countdown. And I know that that is what each one of you looks forward to being wise men for this generation, and looking for the signs. We're going to look at Second Chronicles this morning, if you would turn there. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It is the place where we started 2014 as we moved in to our new sanctuary. I'm still waiting for Second Chronicles to be posted as we walk into the door, so those responsible, <laughs> patience. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Another one of those if then, if you will be my people, then I will be your God. The if word giving us choice. God gives us that great power of choice and that is why that starts with if. And we've talked about if you will be my people. If we want to be God's people, we must be with God. We cannot be his people and not be with him, glorying in his presence. This is God's response to Solomon. Solomon has a beautiful prayer. And this is part of God's response to Solomon. And he says, if my people, and he's talking to us, his people, those of us that call ourselves by his name, I am the Lord's. He is mine. If, look, notice the first of four things that he says, if my people would humble themselves. We're going to focus on that one thing today, humility. Without it, we cannot have a relationship with God. It is impossible. Humility is a choice. It is an attitude. It is an attitude that says, I am not better than others. Very foreign in this world. Because this world is all about being better than others. It's all about competition and having more. And elevating ourselves and focusing on the talents that we have that are not by our own making and elevating ourselves according to what we have. Humility is the opposite of all of that. Humility recognizes that I am no better than anyone else. So it's an attitude that we have to choose. It is not natural. The opposite of humility is what is natural. It's called pride. Pride is the opposite of humility. It was Satan's downfall. God says, your heart became proud because of your beauty. Lucifer was not responsible for his beauty. It had been given to him. But he focused on that, and he became prideful. He became the opposite of who God had made him, a humble being, knowing that he's on equal footing with the other angels, that he was no better. Because we're given an assignment, that because God gives us a high assignment, as he's given to many of the patriarchs, that doesn't make them better. It's never made anyone better. Because he gives us things to do, or because he blesses us with more than we see that someone else has, it's not a reason to become prideful. Humility is an attitude, and it affects how we feel, it affects how we think. It affects how we act. 
and it affects our being. It affects our being. I want to look at one that God said was more humble than any other. Let's go back a few books to the book of Numbers. Let's see what we can learn from what God said about Moses. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And in context of what is said here, Miriam and Aaron are arguing that they're not getting attention for what they've done, and why is Moses getting all the attention? Moses didn't seek to get attention for what greatness God was having him do because he knew that he wasn't producing any of it. He knew it was by God's mighty hand that Pharaoh allowed them to leave Egypt. He knew that God alone had caused the plagues and had got them through the Red Sea. He had gotten them into, he'd taken them into the, into the desert, was sustaining them. It was nothing that he had done. That he couldn't claim any of that. He had a very humble attitude. And one of the things that we need to look at today is that humility doesn't mean a doormat. Most of the time when you think of the word a humble man, you think of one that doesn't say anything, he's just very quiet, um, he doesn't call attention to themselves, and pretty much everyone just walks all over them because they don't stand up for their rights, and they aren't noticed, and they're just trampled on. But that's not what humility is. Go back to Exodus chapter 32. It's back just a little ways. And let's go to verse 25. Now this is right after Moses is on the mountain with God. And God tells him, the people down there, they've made a calf, a golden calf. And so Moses is coming down. He hears all the noise. Let's take it up at verse 25. Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughingstock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come stand over here. And all the Levites rally to him. Moses had great zeal for the Lord. Great zeal. And when he was coming down that mountain, he's facing many inebriated, partying people who are not going to want to be told what to do. Obviously, Aaron let it go, supposed to be the next in control, as he comes down there, he has great courage and great zeal. This man is not a mouse. Humility does not mean that he's going to come down there and say, um, can I say something? No, that's not at all the attitude that he has. He comes down there. He assesses what's going on. He's had a conversation with God about this, and this has to be done. And he says, whoever is for the Lord Stand over here. There is big trouble coming. And you know what happens? He sends the Levites out throughout the camp to take care of all of the ringleaders. People that had seen Moses coming down, slamming the tablets of stone, grinding them up, putting in the water, making them drink it. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the golden calf, making them drink it. A lot of them scattered at that point. They saw how angry Moses was. But there were many who stayed around with the don't tell me what to do attitude. And Moses had to deal with that because God told them it has to be dealt with and these people have to be eliminated. They must be destroyed. So he calls on those that are on God's side. 
He says, come stand with me if you're on God's side. And he sends them through the camp. And they have to kill brothers and fathers and friends and children. Without any question. He must destroy the pride and the arrogance and the horrible abomination that is before the Lord. Look at the attitude that Moses has after that. Go to just to 33, the next chapter, verse 13. He says, Lord, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from the other people on the face of the earth? A humble attitude, loving the people, seeing himself no better than others. And what the other experience that he had had right after the slaying of all the people, he's pleading with the Lord, and he says, Lord, please have mercy, because God says, I'm going to send a plague and just destroy all these other people. And he says, no, Lord, please don't do that. Blot me out of your book instead. Please Save this nation. You're going to make a great name for yourself. That is humility. Humility is not thinking of yourself better than anyone else. He sees himself, I am one of these people. He's just had this unbelievable experience with God on the mountain. He's been given the Ten Commandments. He is communing with God face to face. And he does not see himself any better than the people that are down at the base of the mountain. Do you see why God says that he was the most humble from anyone else on the earth? He didn't take credit for the experience. The fact that he had been picked for this experience made him more accountable. That gave him more of a burden. And God gave him what he needed to carry this burden, but he had to walk in humility. Humility sees itself clearly. Humility sees the truth about itself. It is the hardest lesson that you and I will have to learn on the journey to the promised land because our carnal heart is fit with pride. We come born with it. That pride is growing constantly. Our spiritual man, the the spiritual part of us, knows that humility is the only way to please God. And so there is this huge war going on constantly. It doesn't stop. When we sleep, we rest from it. And when we, we wake up, we take it up again. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 18. We'll start at verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Okay, so this is our parable, mine and yours. I'm going to read that again. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and noticed what his prayer is about. He prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth 
of all I get. The Pharisee is full of himself, so he has really no need from God. God doesn't even acknowledge this prayer. That's the problem with pride. Pride puts a wall between us and God. A prideful heart has no need. A prideful heart is self-sufficient. A prideful heart actually deludes itself, creates an image. It creates an image, a deluded image, and it has no need of anything, cannot see the truth about itself, because when we conjure up a great image of ourselves, we won't see truth. Humility versus pride is you and I deciding which image will we project, the image of Christ or the image of Lucifer. There are only two sides, sheep and goats. The sheep choose to project an image of Christ. We're invited to be like him. Lucifer also invites us to be like him, prideful, self-sufficient, looking down on others. We're righteous in our own eyes. That's why Jesus says to these, those are our shoes. Those are the shoes we want to throw away and not wear anymore. We don't want to be those people. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This man demonstrates humility. He sees himself as who he really is. Remember my quote from Charles Spurgeon last week? When you see yourself for who you really are, you won't have anything to boast about. Yeah, that's where we need to stay. Not that God wants us to look down in order that we can glorify God We're either going to glorify God or glorify self. That's what pride is all about. Look at me. Look what I've accomplished. Look what I can do. Notice me. Humility doesn't do that. Humility understands that anything that we accomplish is not on our own merit. We've we've been given the opportunity. We've been given the talent. We've been given the means. We've been given the opportunity. That's humility. Can take no credit except to say, Lord, I praise you. That was such an awesome experience. Thank you for letting me be a part of that. Thank you for using me as that vessel, as that pipeline for this person or for that person. That is humility. That's what humility recognizes. How can God fill someone who is full of themselves? You and I have to allow the Spirit to empty us, to bring us to where we see ourselves, to who we truly are, so that we can empty self and so that he can fill us that's what the spirit wants to do he wants to fill us with himself and in order to do that we have to let go of pride if my people would humble themselves you and i have to choose we have to choose humility Let's see what James says about that. Go forward just a few books, right after Hebrews. James chapter 4. James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do you know that humility puts you in a position to receive? When we understand the truth about ourselves, and that we are absolutely nothing worthwhile without God, oh, we might be able to do a lot of stuff, we might have a lot of stuff, but it's of no kingdom value at all. No kingdom value. Humility, the attitude that I am the same as everyone else and God sees me the same as everyone else, puts me in a position to receive because I see that I need. I need patience. I need kindness. I need compassion. 
I need gentleness. I need self-control. Lord, I need everything. I need everything. And God says, guess what? I have everything. And I will give you everything that you need as much as you need. When we ask for those things, God is ready to give them to us. And you know why we need to be humbled? Why God says if my people would humble themselves? Because relationships on this planet, the battle of pride and humility, affects us all. We become easily offended. And pride takes us to a place of offense that we cannot get out of. Every day we deal with offense of some kind. People offend us when we're driving. People offend us because we get shortchanged at, at a department store. Um, somebody is rude to us. Somebody doesn't like our food at potluck. Somebody said they were going to come and they didn't. I mean, just, if I gave you five minutes, you could probably write down a hundred things that we can get offended about. And when we are offended, pride is right there. It's natural. And pride takes a step up, and pride looks down. It happens that quickly, that quickly. Humility says, I am the same. Lord, take this from me. I don't want this. I don't want this. I need you to take it from me. See, humility is unwilling to keep offense. We all get offended. We all get offended. There is not a human being living on this planet that does not get offended. It, it's because we're carnal, we're going to get offended about the smallest, ridiculous things. And out of little things grow big things if we don't let them go. And the power that God gives us when we want to let it go is a power that I hope you are experiencing on a daily basis. Because there is a power that comes when you simply let things go straight into the hands of Jesus. I've mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again. Because as we go into experiencing God, it's very necessary that we see this first of four things that God is saying. If my people would humble themselves, meaning you and I have to choose to put these things down. We have to choose to say, Lord, I don't want to be an offended person. I cannot glorify you. My offense will eat me up. You can't pray and have a living, thriving relationship with Almighty God and stay offended. It won't happen. Now, I'm not saying you're going to get rid of the feelings immediately. Sometimes we get hurt deeply. But God knows if we're in the process of trying to get rid and diffuse those feelings, or if we're just throwing gasoline on the fire because we like feeling prideful and arrogant. We become arrogant people when we're prideful. And then God can't tell us anything. When we're saying, don't tell me what to do, we're saying it to God. I don't want to let go of that. I want to, I want to stomp on this person. They've hurt my feelings and, you know, look at me. I'm a big shot. How dare they do that? Did they not know I was a big shot? And the carnal nature inside every one of us, it is a big shot. It does not want to be bothered or inconvenienced in any way. And when somebody pushes in some way, offends us in some way, we are lit and ready to go and burn something. It is who we are. Humility is important. God says if we will humble ourselves, he will lift us up. Wow. If you are willing to let that go, I will exalt you. Wow. Look at the verse right before that. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you want God to be opposed to you? Do you want Almighty God to be opposed? Meaning, he says, don't talk to me. I don't want to hear from you right now. I am opposed to everything you're doing right now because of your pride. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yes, Letty, I see that you're offended. 
And I see that you're really not wanting to let it go. Let it go, Letty. Yes, Lord, I will let it go. God gives me the grace to let it go. I may have to let it go two or three times because feelings, they mess us up. Feelings mess us up royally. And because we're carnal, we tend to ride feelings like the waves. Instead of by thus saith the Lord, we want to live by how we feel. Well, humility is not a feeling. Humility is a choice that I choose to look at the person who has offended me with mercy and with grace because somewhere else someone is feeling that way about me. As quickly as I am offended, I am offending without even thinking about it because I'm a carnal being. It is so important that we learn what humility is because God says, as you give mercy, that's how much I give you. And sometimes the mercy that I want to give someone wouldn't even cover their big toe. Okay, I'll give mercy. Five drops. And God says, really, Letty, you want five drops? You want me to give you five drops? Because it looks to me like you need two or three barrelfuls to cover your problems. When we look at it in the terms of God's plumb line, we're either going to become undone because we love the Lord so much, we want to please him. Moses said, if you are pleased with me, Lord, if you find favor in me, Lord, then be with me. I don't want to be anywhere without you, Lord. Is that our attitude? Is that our attitude today? Let's look at the attitude of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. Go back just a little bit. This is the perfect example of humility. It's found in Philippians chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any relationship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. You cannot be like-minded with people if you're not willing to choose humility. By having the same love, you cannot have the same love with people if you are not wanting to walk in humility. Being one in spirit and purpose cannot have that without humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Do you know how much pride hates that statement? Consider others better than yourself. If we just took that one thing and made it our purpose this week, how different would our attitude be? Would we be anxious to get out and show the Lord, or would we wish that we were sick at home and not have to do it? To consider others better than ourselves. Okay, Lord, I was thinking about others equal with me, but this better thing, that's just more than I can handle. Well, let's keep going. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who was God in the flesh, but did not consider equality with God something for him to use to his own advantage. He's God in the flesh, and he did not use his equality with the Father, something for his own advantage. Does that not blow you away? That reading second Philippians chapter 2 is always so sobering. That he's God, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant he emptied himself. He took on the nature of a servant. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. Why? 
It was the only way to save us. And his love for 